We begin on time and we end on time. No, it's not another group. I was gonna, considering this crowd, I was gonna say something totally on PC, but uh, maybe an ethnic joke or one of these things, but, uh, but I heard uh, it will go over the web, so I will be careful. And this is, uh, won't be, and I'm really glad, you know, when, when the slides start, uh, I'm really glad that nothing funny popped up from my computer, because you never know. Anyway, this, <coughs> it usually begins with John Locke. The reference is, uh, as uh, someone correctly said yesterday, the reference is to a very famous uh, uh, classic libertarian movement memoir, which was, it usually begins with Ayn Rand, 1972, which was actually a memoir about the 60s in the libertarian movement in America. It's full of, uh, it's a little bit, it's full of facts and fiction, as, uh, as you probably know, but it was a somewhat an interesting book. Uh, and it was written when the movement was pretty young. Now we're getting older, much more sophisticated, and, uh, and so it's time, it's not probably time for active political participation, some people may think so, I do not. And it's time for reflection and learning, and when it comes to reflection and learning, maybe Ayn Rand is not the exact philosopher or scholar you want to turn to. Maybe we want to turn to John Locke and actually from the intellectual point of view it all begins with John Locke and um, we'll see immediately what, what begins with John Locke. I would say just basically three things that uh, are very important to us. The first one is pretty good and the second uh, pretty bad and the third one is just as bad. So the first one is the account of property rights and the original acquisition of property. And also seeing self-ownership as the real fact. And uh, a peculiar view of the self as rights bearer. That is what um, comes from John Locke first. But then there's a theoretical, number two, there's a theoretical and rather unhistorical that's an accurate account of the birth of the state. And the third thing is the illusion, the delusion, that uh, many classical liberals, and I want to tell Hopper that I do agree with everything he said about classical liberalism in the 1900s. The only thing, of course, John Locke didn't know that yet, but classical liberals of today should really know what happened after that. There's one thing that tells you everything about the failure of classical liberalism is that um, Golima and Auschwitz came 250 years later, the, the death of John Locke, 241. So the illusion that somehow the state, though it could be considered Leviathan, brutal beast, anything you just name it, could be actually chained. Chained out by what? By a constitution or anyway, domesticated somehow. But still, let's go back to the idea of self-ownership of John Locke. And the claim of self-ownership, you know, this single sentence from um, uh, the second treatise of John Locke is very important. Every man has a property in his own, his own per her, of course, her own person. This nobody has a right to but herself. Now this, to me, is the single most important sentence uh, in uh, the second treatise of govern on government. And uh, in a nutshell, the view in Locke's political philosophy is the view that human beings are rights bearers by nature and because they're self-owners. And the primary moral fact of human existence is self-ownership. And this was a very solid foundation and according to me and a long tradition, of course, before me and uh, I believe after my death will still be there, it is that it's probably the, the poss possibly the best account of property as a source and, a, and it's also a source of morality and justice in human relations. And, um, and it was a big change, you know, most people consider gross use as the father of modern natural rights theory, but it could, it might well be John Locke. Because the idea of John Locke is that natural rights 
do not stand directly from natural law, but from the fact, the simple fact of self-ownership. And I know that some, especially British libertarians, Steve Davis, some of my good friends, do prefer Hume's account, but I still think that uh, not only Locke's is better, but it's politically more viable. And also, now the problem begins when property becomes a political thing in John Locke's analysis. And property, as you know, for John Locke is everything. He says property, that is, his life, liberty, and estate, her life, he was wrong. So this broad notion of property is what man aimed to protect by establishing government. Uh, it didn't happen like that, of course, we you know, but uh, that was uh, his idea. So there are the political implications of the term property. On one side, you have the idea of the natural origin of property. On the other side, you have the idea that the ultimate end of government is the protection of property. So, property became, in that jargon, the code word for life, liberty, and the state. That is, natural rights and freedom, and or freedom. And for Locke, we can see that it's a way of just uh, talking about the legitimacy of the political order. And, um, and we can say, there, there's a good book from John Locke, which is called On the Edge of Anarchy. And uh, I know that Paul Gottfried doesn't like that interpretation. He was just, I uh, believe that Locke was quite conservative indeed. But, uh, but what comes out of his theory is that society, that is government, is preferable to the state of nature only under certain conditions. As the natural state is a state to which only certain limited forms of political society will be preferable. And also, and in this sense, classical liberalism was really shaped by Locke. You, of course, you know that he died about 100 years prior to the word liberalism was in use in Europe and it started to be used in uh, Spain, of all places. And um, so it's really predicated on the notion that human beings enjoy inalienable rights. The word inalienable, inalienable, doesn't, is not in uh, in John Locke, but the concept clearly is there. So the protection of rights is also the ultimate test of legitimate government actions. The state must provide a safe environment for the individual's enjoyment of her natural rights. Now, it all sounds like Disneyland these days, but, uh, but that's the way uh, it was with classical liberalism. And you probably know what uh, Gandhi said, uh, to a journalist who he was, he just visited uh, the UK, and so he said, uh, since according to a lot of press, he was bad mouth in England uh, for many years. He said, "So, what do you think about British civilization?" And he said, "Well, it would be a great idea." And so, and so that's uh, the same thing. What do you think about uh, John Locke? It would be a great idea. The only thing is, we know it did not exactly work uh, like a Swiss watch. Quite the contrary. And so what's, what is really the problem? The problem, well, guess, take a wild guess where the problem is. It is the state. Now, the first thing I wanted to tell you is that libertarianism, we always think it's like the Austrian school, so the understanding of the markets that brought into existence some, some sort of radical anarcho-capitalist or like pure libertarianism. But I think it's very important that it was the failure of classical liberalism that brought libertarianism into existence. It was the failure of classical liberalism to tame the state. It was a disastrous attempt. And uh, so some people said, John Locke tried to build a non-sovereign state. That's an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms. There will never be a non-sovereign state. So, and that, actually, that um, spectacular failure comes from a total lack of understanding of how the state works, of what the state is, and how it was shaped into, new, into a new, very flexible, secular religion. And most classical li liberals just never understood that. It's beginning with John Locke, who, of course, who was... Uh, 
in the 1600s, and then uh, going to um, Buchanan, Milton Friedman, and uh, Hayek. In short, classical liberalism was actually destroyed by the very success of the state. That's one thing we have to recognize. You know, in the beginning of the 1500s, there were probably around two or three states, France and England. Now there are 225 states all over the globe. It, was, it had a tremendous success. When I hear libertarians saying that the state is not successful, it's like when the Marxists were saying that the market doesn't work. You know? it's, uh, we got to cope with that. That's a fact of life. But the thing is, the success of the state was certainly not the minimal state, not the state imagined by John Locke, but it was Leviathan, as it is, and not a watered-down version that was just wishful thinking about the state, and that is very common in uh, classical liberal circles. Now, if, I'll give you just one example of how even the natural rights doctrine that seems perfect a shield for the individual was turned into a status tool, you know. And classical liberalism was quite helpful for establishing the power of the state in modern times. Under the pressure of the natural law project, the state accelerated its growth, bringing about a state reduced to two actors. And that, from the beginning, was the real project of the modern state. We'll leave on the scene two actors, the state and the free individual. You can take a wild guess about whose actor was more powerful. So modern state and the modern individual are the consequence of the same process, and they became allies in the same life and death struggle against old ideologies and practices, that is, against the medieval cosmos that dominated. In practice, there was this promise of the modern state to the modern individual, I will free you. From all these masters, you have like 16 or 17, you've got your corporation, you've got your church, your family, your children, even your friends will free you from everything. And actually, if you're a servant of 16 masters, maybe you're not such a slave. But if you do have only one owner, then you do become a slave. And so Locke actually believed that natural rights were a shield for the individual. But the outcome, as I said, was very different. Natural law theory turned out instead to be the most sophisticated country of legal myths ever created over the long history of legal thought. Such a complex ordered myths gave rise to a true legal mythology on which the state still thrives. You, to put it very bluntly, the state, or the man who we're talking on behalf of the state, said, yeah, you're right, John Locke lives, lives and property. We're here to protect them. What else? So the thing is, classical liberalism never understood much about the essence of the state, and I will tell you very briefly what it is. First of all, the project, of the, the essence, this would be like the essence of the state project. First of all, the idea was to destroy the medieval universe by freeing the individual from all other authorities and relations. Second one, and probably the most important one, was the centralization of power to create one command center for all governmental operations. A single decision-making room where you could just take all, make all the decisions, which gradually imposed itself on all other centers. And then it was the creation of boundaries. Now, the boundaries are very important for the modern state. You cannot even think of a state without boundaries. Remember where the astronauts uh, left Earth for the first time. And so the first question of uh, Cape Canaveral was, uh, how does the Earth look like? And they said, well, we didn't see any borders. And so they started, we're all the human race, we're all equal. No, they were just saying a very simple thing. We're used to see the world with borders. Borders are not a natural thing. But the thing is, they're so natural to us that they became natural. Institutions tend to become very natural. And now we're thinking. So the idea of the borders was 
that he created a legal order and a political order inside. And inside them, you made good citizens through education. You could control the money, you could control the goods and everything else. And but the idea was actually to bring peace. And one thing we have to cope with, or just uh, simply to admit, is that uh, there was a certain pacification of society with the state. In due time, it was a very long process. But right now, crime is much lower than it used to be 40 years ago, 100 years ago. You can take old statistics, and they, that will show that. Of course, the amount of violence was exported in the outside, in the other arena of the state. So we just use, we often, we, libertarians have this terrible um, habit of just using the term state to describe political power, but the word and the object are very recent. The expression modern state in itself is pleonastic, like um, Middle French, what was it uh, that you said yesterday? It was, a, it was just a Belgian joke. Uh, how do you call it? Middle, the, the Middle French, the Moyen France, Francais, pleonasm. So it was rather pleonastic, though, and uh, because the state is only modern, there's uh, there's nothing like the state prior to modern times, and uh, and actually the word came out in the prints for the first time and used in the modern sense, the state uh, at the beginning of the 16th century, and during the 16th and 17th centuries, the medieval order was destroyed by the success of this new entity that imposed new radically new relations and a special one, of course, with the individual, the only other one, the state, recognized only individuals, never communities, churches, and nothing else. Was, the state was there to emancipate and liberate the individuals. And we're all individuals shaped by the modern state. Whoa, I did, how does it work? Now, all right, this is, uh, this is what I would call the grand, the spectacular libertarian illusion. Because there's a small group of people acting in the name of the state, you know, the rulers, and they definitely are a separate group with norms and a different ethical code. They created a lexicon in due time. And so, on. so in order to defend their position, a great dichotomy was erected between the public sphere and the private sphere. And this is, so the grand libertarian illusion is that you can destroy the state in your mind. If you just do this, you just break this dichotomy. And so because libertarians do entertain the bizarre idea that what is, Ill is illegitimate in private law, theft, murder, should not be legitimate in public law. So, so this, um, somehow, the libertarians believe the dichotomy has to be destroyed, and thus the state would be seen by everybody, everyone immediately as a predatory organization based on permanent aggression on individual rights. It might happen, but it doesn't, doesn't disappear like a nightmare, you know, when, when you do this, the dichotomy is, well, oh, I, I don't know how I could do that. Now, the other thing, the other story of the libertarian, I will go very quickly through that, of the libertarian view of the state is the idea of plunder and property. So on one side, this is, it kind of begins with um, Frédéric Bastiat that was uh, written in, I guess it comes from the law, 1948, and then, uh, of course, Calhoun. And um, the idea you know, that man can live and satisfy his wants only by ceases labor. And uh, this is the origin of property, but of course you can get the property of others. And this process is the origin of plunder. And uh, this other one, which is public choice in, of the 1850, is the idea that the unequal fiscal action of the government divides the community into two great classes, those who pay the taxes and those who are, in fact, supported by the government, taxpayers and tax consumers. This is another very well-known quotation for libertarians. Now, this is another one, Oppenheimer. Um, a Marxist uh, that, um, although a radical school of the beginning of the century that uh, somehow libertarians fell in love with. 
from Albert J. Knopf to, to Rothbard. And, um, and uh, you, you, know, you know this quotation very well, so uh, economic, uh, economic means and political means, and then, of course, there's, uh, there's uh, Albert J. Knopf, and then you have this uh, very nice quotation from, from Roth, Rothbard that says, social power is man's power over nature, State power is the coercive and parasitic seizure of this production, the draining of the fruits of society for the benefit of non-productive rulers. While social power is over nature, nature state power is power over men. Very nice to put, and very true, indeed. And then, actually, Rothbard says something which may not be true, because he says, the 20th century has been primarily an age in which state power has been catching up with a consequent reversion to slavery, war, and destruction. That's true. That's definitely true. But the creation of wealth during the 20th century was, uh, it, it happened anyway. And that's, uh, that's a little bit of a problem uh, for that kind of analysis. But anyway, from Bastiat to Rothbard, the state appears as a machinery controlled by the ruling class to exploit and dominate society. And this is very much true, but it's not the essence of the state. The, this theory, in fact, identifies state and power, state and coercion, and it sees the state operating in ancient times. Uh, the barbarians had a state, uh, the medieval time had a state, and it's really based on a sociological model of the state that ignores the, the core of the state, which is the historical dimension and the historical aspect of the state. So if we want to know something about the state, history is crucial. History is the key point. Because the type of political order in force today, far from being the sole and inevitable product of universal reason, is but the rather occasional result of a series of historical junctures. Ah. Oh, all right, this was easy. And also, another thing that um, is the idea that the modern state is a secular religion, and that's not part uh, and parcel of uh, uh, the libertarian understanding of the state. And, uh, and also, if you think about many modern and contemporary political philosophers, emphasize the importance of a civic religion, from Machiavelli to Rousseau to Charles Taylor to all these kind of people. And the importance is clear, actually, because the main unethical principles on which the state is based cannot be accepted without a strong theoretical framework defending the power and legitimacy of secular institutions. This is what exactly what the rightist and leftist uh, state of secularism are doing. There are two different ways to build a strong, because religious ideological support for the state. So what, what's the lesson from this? If you believe that the state power is historical, it is also contingent. And it is changing over time, a little bit. It's got a project, but it changes. I mean, it responds to certain uh, changing over time. And, um, and also, you have to realize that we're not fighting against uh, the Roman Empire. <laughs> we're not fighting against the Greek polis. We have a quarrel with war our enemy, the, the state, the very modern, modern state. So. Uh, we just we could realize that people lived for many years under, under different institutions that uh, were not uh, a state, and we could learn a lot, a lot by that from medieval times. And one time after the end of the state, we know that the human race will live under different arrangements. And another thing we can learn is that there is certainly no scientific law imposing the state solution for the so-called public goods problem or the production of security. So if we realize that the state is a provisional and recent European invention, and um, it's very important for libertarians, and we might consider it a nightmare, but the only way of beginning to wake up is to understand how it works and how it came to existence. And, um, 
actually the key to the success of the state, but I will not have time to elaborate upon that, is that the state does not exist. It, does, it exists only in people's minds. We're not, we do not live in status societies. We live in societies shaped by centuries of discussions about the state. So actually, I've never seen the state, but I see people always talking about the state and, and, and on behalf of the state. Also, have never seen sovereignty. Have you seen sovereignty? I guess not. Not even a nation or anything like that, or all the jargon that's used by, by the people who talk on behalf of the state. But I know that there are hundreds of theories of sovereignty, and of course, Jean Baudin's is still the most important for the birth of the state. And uh, just to, keep, to, to show you that you can learn something even from Jean Le Carré, <laughs> I, I will end with this uh, quote from Le Carré. The state is a dream, a symbol of nothing at all, an emptiness, a mind without a body, a game played with clouds in the sky. But states make war, don't they, and imprison people. Thank you. <laughs>